Hello, this is Susan Patrick from iNACL, and we will begin in just one minute when everyone joins. Thank you. Great. It's 2 o'clock Eastern, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for today's leadership webinar, Next Steps Under the Every Student Succeeds Act, the new federal law. I will be your moderator and facilitator today. Uh, if you look in the lower left-hand corner on the webinar, there is a chat room where people that are joining are uh, introducing themselves, their name, their school or organization, and the city-state where they're joining us today. Um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat room. I will also be monitoring questions in the chat room today. So please feel free as you have questions to type uh, questions in the chat room and we'll be bringing those up. We will have a Q&A period at the end. Today's presenters, I am uh, pleased that we have with us today Lillian Pace, who is the Senior Director of National Policy for KnowledgeWorks, and our own Maria Worthen from iNACL, who is the Vice President for Federal and State Policy. Uh, today, I'll start off by offering some key terms, and we're going to cover what's in the Every Student Succeeds Act. Maria is going to start off by doing an EFSA, or ESSA, policy overview. Lillian will describe sections of ESSA and opportunities for personalized learning. And then Maria will address how K-12 educators can seize these opportunities. I'll do a wrap-up at the end, and we'll also have time for Q&A, questions and answers. So some key terms are developing a new education system in K-12 education. We are at a really historic time in history right now with a new federal law shifting power back to states back to localities and back to local schools and school divisions. So thinking about what that means for competency-based education. Competency-based education is a system that is built around the student, centered on the student and the student developing mastery. So students advance upon demonstrated mastery that students are developing competencies that include explicit and transferable learning objectives that empower students. Students are aware of those learning goals and when they reach them. Assessment becomes a meaningful and positive learning experience for students. They know when they've achieved those learning objectives. And if they don't, students are receiving timely differentiated support. So in the system of competency-based education, focused on mastery, students are really aware of our learning outcomes, and they don't move forward when they have gaps. They are demonstrating those, the mastery of those competencies, and learning outcomes also include competencies that include the application and creation of knowledge and important skills and dispositions, sometimes thought of as 21st century skills, the ability to navigate so you have the skills for success uh, around the whole child. The other key term here is around personalized learning. And when fundamentally you think about what personalizing learning means for students, think of this as a verb. We are going to personalize per person for each individual student. Personalized learning, tailoring their learning experiences, tailoring their learning for each student's strengths, needs, and interests, including enabling some student agency, giving them voice and choice in what, how, when, and where they learn. We're holding all students to the same high expectations and rigor, but we're providing flexibility and additional supports to ensure that students reach mastery of the highest standards possible. So when you think about each student having their own identity, their own passions, their own interests, um, needing to read certain certain, um, reach certain learning objectives, but being able to have a range of ways of doing that. You might think of it, if you haven't seen this slide, as this S-curve or line as a subject, whether it's algebra, whether it's another subject. And there may be 
textbooks that help, can help a student learn, but there may be online courses, online modules, online game simulations. There may be learning opportunities and internships. Each of these little circles represents uh, a node or or a way to apply knowledge, an application of knowledge. So there may be practice opportunities, real world skill and knowledge applications, internships, after school problems, programs, and museums. So if a student is responsible for certain English language art standards, certain math standards, certain science standards, if they are really interested in alternative energy or, or um, wind power, they could address all of this, um, a range of different subjects, a range of different competencies and learning objectives, and pull those together. So the idea of really next generation learning and personalizing learning is around moving up that S curve of a subject or of a, of a group of subjects by practicing and demonstrating mastery along different nodes, true personalization. So, those are some key terms and key ideas that will help level set this conversation. And I will turn it over to Maria Worthen to talk about some uh, ideas around key policies that help us enable this shift to personalized learning and what an opportunity we have with a new Every Student Succeeds Thank Act. Thank you very Maria? much, Susan, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Before we get into the substance of the new federal K-12 education law, or ESSA, I just want to give a little bit of quick context on how we have gotten to this point where we have a federal law that is starting to really recognize and enable the shift to personalized learning. These are movements that started many years ago in some cases in, in decades ago, for example, in Chugach, Alaska, which is what we think of as the birthplace of competency education, of innovators at the local level uh, seeking flexibility within existing policy to have a more student-centered education system. And these local innovations have bubbled up to districts and to states, and we're, and, and we're starting to see this providing an upward pressure on the system when it comes to the federal policy, which has resulted in the changes that we're going to discuss today. Um, but there are some remaining barriers prior to the passage of the SSA that really couldn't be addressed by state policy. This was the alignment of accountability and assessment systems which is the really big change we're going to talk about today. But at the state level, states can really make a difference with opening up flexibility for innovative districts and schools, providing credit flexibility, for example, and providing more equitable access to multiple pathways to college and career readiness, just to name a few. This map shows, and I know the text is really too small on the key here, but um, the the darker the color, the um, higher along the continuum these states are. So this map shows where we were in 2012 with states implementing policies to support competency-based education. And you'll see when I come to the next slide how much of a shift we've seen in the last four years of more states lighting up on this map recognizing the true potential of policies to support competency education and moving us towards a more personalized student-centered education system. So before we talk about that federal law, I just want to emphasize this isn't a top-down change. This is really something that has bubbled up from districts to states, and finally the federal government has come into alignment in making more changes to open up innovation, accountability, and assessment. So this past December, the United States Congress passed and the President signed into law the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, formerly known as No Child Left Behind. 
in an era of pretty rancorous partisan debate, it was really significant to see so much consensus in Congress around what needed to change and so much consensus in the passage of this law. We saw an almost unanimous vote on this bill in the Senate Education Committee and, and a very, very uh, large majority passing it in the full Senate as well as in the House. So um, I think that's significant to note given the tone of politics these days that there was consensus on both sides of the aisle that no Child Left Behind was outdated, it needed to be updated, and there needed to be more flexibility given to states. Uh, this new law will be in place fully by the 2017-2018 school year. So even though this new law is passed, we're still technically operating under No Child Left Behind uh, until next year although states are already starting to think about or should be starting to think about how they're going to be making this shift. So right now what we're watching is seeing the U.S. Department of Education begin the process to issue regulations on how this law will actually work. So that's something that we're paying attention to. Some of the big themes that we see in this new law uh, High expectations and transparency. This is something, a goal of No Child Left Behind that's been carried forward. I think everyone agreed in Congress that it was important to maintain transparency of data on how our students were doing and to keep track of the achievement gaps between different groups of students. So that is something that remains the same. However, as William will talk about the way that states can measure and report on that achievement has changed um, and there's a lot more flexibility for states in that. States are still required to act when schools underperform. However, again, there's more flexibility. Flexibility is a huge theme of this law in terms of how the state can intervene in underperforming schools. States have a great deal more autonomy, as I've mentioned, and the U.S. Department of Education, the Secretary, has a lot less power and authority um, over regulations for, um, uh, you know, implying that states, for example, should adopt a certain type of academic standard as we saw with some of the, uh, the waivers and race to the top, there was some, some pushback from states as to the prescriptiveness of the implementation of the federal K-12 education law. So we're really seeing a lot more autonomy going back to the states and as a consequence, more local control. And then we saw program consolidation, which again, Lillian's going to be talking about uh, putting more pots of money together um, and allowing more flexibility in how that money is spent. And finally, there is more room for innovation across the bill. There's more room for innovation on accountability. There's more room for innovation on assessment. And there's more room for innovation around teachers. Highly qualified teacher is gone. That, that requirement, which was a time-based requirement, is no longer something that states have to abide by. It will allow tremendous opportunities for innovation on human capital and teacher capacity. So those are some of the big themes of the SSA. But what remains the same is that states still need to adopt challenging state academic standards. They still need to test students annually in math and reading. They still need to publicly report those scores based on subgroups. They still need to identify schools for improvement. And there are still um, the same formulas for distributing title funds. In terms of the timeline, as I mentioned, the Department of Education needs to issue its final regulations by December. Uh, so right now we are in the middle of this continuum 
where the department has already gathered public input on the implementation of Title I, and there is a negotiated rulemaking panel of various advocates and experts from across the field of education that are hashing out the details of what uh, Title I uh, it will look like. The department has also put out a call for input on non-regulatory guidance that they might issue. And we expect to see not only non-regulatory guidance and the rules put out by this negotiated rulemaking committee, but also some separate regulatory actions throughout the summer and fall. And then we should see those final regulations by the fall and winter. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lillian, who will talk about the opportunities in ESSA for personalized learning. Great. Thank you, Maria. And um, it's a pleasure to join all of you guys today. Um, as Maria mentioned, it's quite amazing that this law uh, actually got across the finish line and, and incredibly exciting to have the opportunity to sit here and talk about all of the opportunities that exist to advance personalized learning. Um, I quite honestly wasn't sure we would ever see this day, so I'm enjoying my job much more um, that we are here now. Um, so KnowledgeWorks is uh, an operating foundation that um, really is focused on the mission of um, ensuring that every student benefits from high quality personalized learning experiences. So since ESSA was enacted um, almost, gosh, I guess five months ago now, um, we've really been working hard to try to figure out what it means for personalized learning and to help states as they begin to design um, their new visions for teaching and learning. We're really hopeful that states are going to build um, on the, the great things about No Child Left Behind, but really work to transcend um, uh, federal and state policy in those spaces and, and create a comprehensive vision for personalized learning in their states. Um, we've released a couple of resources, one of which I'm going to walk through um, today, um, but I encourage uh, you to visit our website um, at www.knowledgeworks.org slash policy slash ESSA, and I know it's um, going to be included there in the chat box if you're looking for more resources after today's webinar. So. Uh, let's jump in. Um, so the information I'm going to share today comes directly from a side-by-side -side document that we released, which compares the opportunities for personalized learning in ESSA uh, to uh, No Child Left Behind in the Obama administration's waiver package. Um, and again, you can access that, that full document uh, if you wanted to, to follow along and have more detail at the link there on the slide. So the First topic area that I'm going to address um, are next generation assessments. And as Maria mentioned, you know, states still are going to have to test students annually in math and English language arts in grades four through eight and once in high school. But ESSA really provides states with unprecedented opportunities to build next generation assessment systems. And this is really important because we're at a time where we have to change the national dialogue around testing. Um, we all are, are well aware of the national opt-out movement um, that really came about because tests were not useful. Parents and, and, and um, students really couldn't see value in the tests that, that students were being asked to take. Um, you know, we, we suggest that the answer is not to walk away from testing, but to actually have a conversation and begin to build better tests. Um, and we're excited about these opportunities in ESSA. Um, we think that they will provide um, a states an opportunity to build assessments that, that really get to a better and more meaningful picture of student learning and provide more useful data to help stakeholders design real-time support. So the opportunities um, that uh, are, are included in the law, so the first is that um, summative assessments, which you know, traditionally have been your end of the year, um, uh, high stakes, uh, multiple choice tests, um, states now have the opportunity to break those assessments down into multiple uh, statewide interim assessments that when combined will roll up to produce an annual summative score. And this is meaningful for a couple of reasons. One, it provides an opportunity to capture data 
faster, um, closer to real time on where students are so it can inform a, a much more robust continuous improvement process around student learning. Um, but it also hopefully would eliminate some of that high stakes feel and pressure at the end of the year where you have students, you know, sort of regrouped doing test prep uh, going into um, these, you know, very, very long assessment processes. Instead, you could provide them with assessments when they are ready to demonstrate mastery. Secondly, the assessments um, are allowed to measure individual student growth. This was something that was permitted um, within the Obama administration's waiver package. Uh, this provision is codified in law now. Um, and when we, we'll talk a little bit more about why this is so important when we get to the accountability system. Um, but we do have an opportunity now to really use assessments to meet students where they are and design much more robust supports to get them to where we want them to be um, uh, in time for um, graduation. Third, assessments can be um, partially delivered through portfolios, projects, or extended performance tasks. Again, this is to get away from, from those multiple choice only tests that um, weren't really providing the rich picture of student learning that, that we need in order to design an effective education system. Um, so potentially some great um, advancements could happen with this piece. Um, and last, states may use computer adaptive assessments to measure a student's academic proficiency above or below grade level. So, so um, an assessment instrument that uh, asks questions targeted to where a student's proficiency is in order to figure out where they are. So if you answer a question correctly, you would get a more difficult question. If you ask, answer the question incorrectly, you would have a question that would be a little easier until the assessment figured out exactly where a student's performance is. Um, what's great about that is it gives us an opportunity um, to identify all of the students that were below proficiency that, that uh, current tests are not telling us where they are. So we can design more uh, support. Um, what's important to message here um, is that we have to also always make sure we're holding these students to high expectations. So we use that information about where students are to make sure we get them to the expectations level where we want them to succeed. So while those um, improvements are exciting, um, and most states, I think, will be able to do some wonderful things with them, um, there is another opportunity in SF called the Innovative Assessment Pilot that really is going to provide a select number of states, so up to seven initially, an opportunity to really think outside the box on assessment. Um, this is a pilot program that was modeled after New Hampshire's um, efforts to build a competency-based assessment system to support their statewide transition to competency education. New Hampshire received a waiver from the U.S. Department of Education, so they are in the process of really testing out their assessment system. Um, but this opportunity now would give uh, other states an opportunity to think outside the box. Um, they do not have to do New Hampshire's approach. In fact, um, we're hopeful that we see a number of different ideas to innovative assessment emerge from this opportunity. So um, again, I mentioned up to seven states initially will have the opportunity to apply for this pilot, um, but after three years, the secretary has the authority to extend it to any state. Um, there's an emphasis on building innovative and competency-based systems of assessment. Um, states can use these assessment systems that they're building for accountability purposes to ensure that the incentives in the system are aligned behind the new effort. Um, it waives the requirement that states um, have to implement statewide assessments. So as they're beginning to pilot their new innovative ideas, they can begin with a select group of districts, um, as long as they can scale their assessment design statewide by the end of the demonstration authority. Um, and I think it's important to, to note, this is going to be a very difficult path forward for states. Um, you know, these assessments are going to have to demonstrate high technical quality, and they're going to have to prove that they're comparable to the statewide assessments that were already in place. So um, this will be a high bar, but I think it's a very encouraging place um, for us to begin to engage about what's possible with next generation assessments. 
Um, and I'll mention the U.S. Department of Education is planning to regulate on this uh, innovative assessment pilot, so we suspect that there will be very robust conversations in Washington um, throughout the course of this year on what uh, safeguards need to be in place to make this a high quality initiative. So accountability. This is um, an incredibly important topic, obviously. Um, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in the accountability provisions. Um, in order to understand the flexibilities, I'm going to talk quickly about what ESSA requires of states. So states will have to establish long-term goals with measurements of interim progress for all students and subgroups of students based on academic performance, on state assessments, graduation rates, and progress in achieving English language profici proficiency for English learners. Um, so this is similar to the concept from No Child Left Behind where all students had to be proficient um, by 2014. Obviously that goal was a little too ambitious and that's why we um, ended up with, you know, every, almost every school failing in the country. Um, so states are now given a tall task to figure out what, what goal they're going to use to replace that. Um, states then will have to build an accountability system that integrates the progress on the, the long-term goals and the academic indicators I just mentioned, um, along with at least one measure of school quality or student success. Now, this is kind of really a wide open door um, for accountability indicators. Um, that additional indicator does not have to be an academic one. Um, it also doesn't have to be just one. It can be multiple measures that states decide they want to include in their system. States also have significant flexibility in how they weight those indicators in the system. Um, the law does require that the academic indicators carry substantial weight and in aggregate carry greater weight than the measures of school quality or student success. Um, and I suspect we'll learn a lot about uh, what the current administration thinks those terms should mean as the regulations come out um, uh, later this year. But um, nonetheless, uh, Congress was very flexible in the wording here. And so what we're going to see, or we're really going to see states begin to have deep conversations about what they want to include in their accountability system. Um, we hope that they look to integrate personalized learning indicators um, into their accountability system and really assign those indicators with enough weight to drive student-centered teaching and learning practices. There are some examples of um, some personalized learning, learning indicators on the slide there that, that we've shared with states. Um, we think it's important that this includes taking a deeper look at growth. Um, we want to see that every student is performing at a rate of growth that will ensure proficiency by graduation. We want to know that students are progressing to deeper levels of mastery on state standards and aligned competencies. Um, these are really important um, uh, things that we want to see states incorporate into their systems. I will flag um, states are already beginning to have these conversations. Um, some states have even advanced uh, policies to make these systems a reality. In fact, Connecticut um, in March, uh, the state board has already approved a new accountability system meant to align with uh, ESSA that includes multiple measures other than test scores. So um, in Connecticut, they are looking to um, include three ways of measuring graduation rates on track, four and six year rates. Um, they're looking at post-graduation career preparedness, college enrollment, the percentage of chronically absent students, physical fitness, and access to the arts. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not here to endorse those indicators, but I'm, I'm sharing that as an example of, of the conversations that we're beginning to see happen in states around what they want to value in their accountability system. So, that brings us to school improvement. Um, ESSA really changed course on school improvement. Many of you may remember that prior to ESSA, states were really bound to these four federally defined turnaround models for their lowest performing schools. Um, ESSA does not mention these models. Um, really, the law leaves it up to states to develop their own framework for providing supports and interventions to identified schools. There are really only a few requirements in the law um, for school improvements. So first, states 
still have to establish um, two categories of schools for intervention, so comprehensive support and improvement, which are those bottom 5% that we've seen states have to identify previously, um, and targeted support and improvement schools, and those are really the schools that have consistently underperforming subgroups. Um, states um, will have to ensure that interventions in these schools are evidence-based, um, but doesn't say what the interventions must look like. Um, so the new bar is that they're evidence-based. Um, and lastly, that states really must do something. Um, they must have uh, implement more rigorous interventions in um, identified schools that are really not improving. Um, and it leaves it up to the state to define how many years until they go back in and decide something more aggressive needs to be done, although it does say that that time period cannot exceed four years. So really, this could be a great opportunity for states um, to develop a set of, you know, state-level turnaround principles aligned to personalized learning. School districts could have the flexibility to develop their own turnaround models as long as they incorporate the state's turnaround principles and as long as those turnaround models, of course, are evidence-based um, as the law requires. So some of the examples of, of turnaround principles that we've been talking to states about are, um, you know, community engagement and ownership and the vision uh, for, the, for the school turnaround, transparency of standards that we know are so critical in, in competency-based learning environments, um, teaching and learning aligned to achievement level and not age, real-time access and use of student achievement data instead of the annual look back kind of autopsy approach that we had in place under No Child Left Behind. Um, making sure they're designing learning experiences that are shaped by student voice. Um, and really emphasizing not just academic content knowledge, but also social and emotional competencies, which we know are critical to educating the whole child. So the fifth, fifth opportunity um, is really this new idea, this direct student services provision. Um, this is kind of, I think, Congress's creative attempt to, to lump together um, all of the people that were advocating for the, the No Child Left Behind um, Supplemental Educational Services provision, which was essentially a, a districts had to withhold 10% of Title I funding um, in underperforming districts. Uh, for tutoring services, so there were still people that thought that, that there should be some sort of tutoring presence. Um, there was a new, new voices emerging advocating for school choice. Um, obviously, the vouchers conversation continued, and so um, there were a lot of different voices that were trying to address the, the, the problem of what do we do for the students that are trapped in these underperforming schools while we work to turn around those schools? Um, and so what emerged is this direct student services provision, and it allows states to reserve up to 3% of their Title I Part A grant to provide direct services to students um, prioritized at the highest, uh, I'm sorry, the lowest performing schools and, and the, the targeted support and improvement schools. Um, and the activities that that um, these dollars must be spent on are really interesting. So if you look there at the slide, um, it's everything from enrollment in courses not available at a student's school um, to, you know, accessing post-secondary credit in high school um, to the one that I've, I've highlighted for us all there, components of a personalized learning approach. Um, our words appear right there. And so I think... Um, it's pretty clear that this is a very flexible pot of money. It's in May, so states do not have to make this reservation. But if they do, um, I think they could do some pretty compelling things um, with this. Some of the ideas that, you know, we've begun to, to float to states as they're in the very early design process are, you know, what if, what if you as a state decided to design a digital registry of credit-bearing personalized learning opportunities, both inside and outside the classroom, that are aligned to state standards and competencies. Think about how that could significantly expand student access to high-quality extended learning opportunities. We've encouraged states to think about establishing a network of high-impact early college high schools where students have an opportunity to earn um, high school and post-secondary credit simultaneously heading into graduation and can graduate with up to 60 college credits and associate's degree. 
Um, the, there's an organization called Sheets for Change that just released a report, I believe it was this week, um, providing technical assistance to states around this new provision um, where they recommend ideas like creating a robust course access program, which I know is something that INACL has, has worked on um, previously, um, supporting a virtual network of advanced placement courses. Um, and, of course, um, the idea of advancing school choice. So we're seeing a lot of interesting ideas pop up in this space, and I think it could be a nice opportunity to advance personalized learning. Uh, so Maria mentioned the elimination of the highly qualified teacher um, requirement. That might not sound like an opportunity that something's eliminated, um, but it really is because the provision became a little bit onerous and a little bit burdensome when we when we began to look at personalized learning environments. In fact, um, shifting into, you know, when, when we would visit districts, this was one of the biggest challenges that, that we would hear is that, um, you know, state certification policies, how to qualify teacher, you know, and none of these were designed in a way to reflect the emerging needs um, uh, and, and new teaching roles that we see in personalized learning environments. Um, so, what, the, what ESSA does is it replaces the highly qualified teacher requirement um, with a, a, a new bar, which basically just says teachers need to meet the applicable state certification and licensure requirements. So we are strongly encouraging states to not just use their existing certification and licensure requirements, but to begin to have a robust conversation to revisit and modernize those to make sure that they reflect these emerging teaching roles that we're seeing in personalized learning environments. Um, and I should mention, um, INACL and KnowledgeWorks actually worked together on a white paper that we released um, a couple years ago with a series of recommendations um, for how states can really begin to um, design a comprehensive educator workforce system um, to put the policies in place to ensure that we are ready um, to educate in personalized learning environments. Um, uh, our recommendations there were, you know, pushing states to develop a set of statewide instructional competencies to align all elements of their human capital system, so pre-service, credentialing, professional development, um, teacher evaluation, to these statewide competencies, um, and to really ensure that educators have the same personalized career pathway that we want for our students. So I encourage you, if you haven't seen that paper, to, to take a look, because I think some of those ideas are, are more than ever relevant. Um, the next piece, uh, so within the, the Title II professional development program, there is an allowable reservation for states of up to 3% um, to really focus on um, developing leaders to, to help, um, particularly leaders that are in our lowest performing schools, really need extra support and capacity building. Um, this could be an, incredibly oppor an incredible opportunity if you think from a personalized learning lens about how to um, support, create a community of practice for our principals that um, are in these environments where they need to begin personalized instruction for students because they have students that are at varying different levels of learning, um, and we want to make sure that we can get every single student to proficiency upon graduation in those learning environments. So um, really good opportunity for states to think outside the box with what they could do for these, with these 3% of funds. Um, and as always, we encourage them to make sure that any kind of professional development program they're putting in place, that it is personalized. Um, just like we want for our students, so customized, embedded, aligned to the statewide professional competencies um, that we think are so critical to have. So number eight, um, this is uh, a very big new block grant program. Um, Maria mentioned one of the meta themes from uh, uh, ESSA is really sort of this program consolidation and more room for innovation. Um, we see this very much in, in the new Title IV program called the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant. Um, essentially, uh, Congress decided to consolidate a number of smaller programs um, where, to be honest, um, a little bit of money was trickling down at the local level and not able to have a tremendous amount of impact um, into this, this larger block grant where states have more flexibility 
to think outside the box, focus on these sort of three key areas. Um, providing all students with access to a well-rounded education, critically important. Improving school conditions for student learning, improving the use of technology to improve academic achievement and digital literacy. Um, so we are encouraging states to be thoughtful and not just to kind of continue to use the block grant to fund maybe some of those same line items they used to fund, but to think about how they can leverage this block grant um, to do things like create an innovation fund for districts that are interested in scaling personalized learning, to really think about how to support um, the technology improvements that are necessary to support personalized learning at scale um, in, our, in our innovative districts. So hopeful that we have some really encouraging conversations with states as they move from the design phase into putting pen on paper. Um, the ninth one here is the 21st Century Community Learning Centers grant program. So this is not a new program. This was part of No Child Left Behind. Uh, it continues under ESSA. Um, but what is different here um, is that instead of continuing to fund as strictly an after-school program, so the 21st Century Community Learning Centers program is sort of the nation's after-school program, um, what, there was sort of a slight change in the law that began to recognize that um, we want to ensure better alignment to what happens in after-school with what happens inside the traditional classroom setting. Um, so there's a great opportunity when we think about personalized learning to think about how states can use this pot of funding to provide better academic enriching opportunities both inside and outside of the traditional classroom setting. So we are encouraging states as they're looking at this opportunity to really think about, you know, could you put a priority in place to ensure that um, partnerships are being thoughtful about a, how to offer high-quality credit-bearing experiences outside the classroom that help students go deeper in mastery of standards and competencies. Um, we've, we've seen this uh, idea emerge already in some innovative states. New Hampshire has already done this, has prioritized their pot of funding um, to support, support credit-bearing learning experiences statewide. Um, Providence After School Alliance in Rhode Island has done some phenomenal work in this area, um, creating a whole community-wide approach to, to credit-bearing learning experiences for middle schoolers um, on uh, quote-unquote campuses around the community. Um, and so really exciting stuff there. If you're interested in learning more about the um, intersection between competency-based learning and after school and all of the promise that's there, encourage you to visit the American Youth Policy Forum. They're doing a lot of great work in this area to think differently about extended learning opportunities. Um, and I know they just released a report on this very topic uh, this year that might be worth looking at. And the last opportunity I'll mention um, is uh, the, the community programs that are, that are authorized in this bill. So there's two new programs. Um, uh, well, it's really one program, the Community Support for School Success Grants, that has two focus areas. Uh, one is called Promise Neighborhoods and one is called Full Service Community Schools. Um, these are not new in that they were funded through the appropriations process as a line item for several years. This is the first time they're authorized as part of um, the federal education law. and so. Um, it's a great opportunity, again, as we start to think about transitioning to competency-based environments. We think about all the new um, stakeholders and voices that we need to engage in the development of these learning environments. Our community partners are going to be incredibly important um, uh, in these conversations. And so Promise Neighborhoods give us an opportunity to really go into our most distressed communities, um, and, and begin to build a neighborhood approach to transforming um, teaching and learning for students. Um, and full service community schools gives us an opportunity to put a coordinator inside the school building to support um, the integration of all the community services that traditionally happen outside the school building and bring them in to support students in their everyday learning experience. So a lot of really good opportunities with these two particular programs as well. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back uh, to Maria uh, to provide us with some um, additional thoughts, but I, I think it's just important. I just want to leave one last message. Um, each of these opportunities is interesting, 
um, but on its own, really not going to provide the kind of transformation that we are hopeful um, and we believe can happen under ESSA. And so we are really encouraging states to, to knit together all of these opportunities into a compelling vision for personalized learning. Um, and, and we are really hopeful that they will do that and not just kind of check the box in one or two places um, and, and think that that really represents true change. So with that, we'll right. turn it Thank over. You, Thank you, Lillian, for all of that wonderful information. And as we move forward and wrap up this webinar, I encourage if anyone has any specific questions or general questions, please go ahead and put that in the chat box. We'll, we'll try to answer them as, as we can. Um, so today you've heard us throw around a lot of words like flexibility, states can, states could, may, allowable. And the point of this is that a shift to personalized learning under ESSA is possible, but it's not a given. This is not a top-down mandate for schools to do personalized learning, to do competency-based education. This is flexibility. This is opening up options that states can take advantage of if they so choose to come into alignment with a more student-centered system of learning. Um, and so it's really the interaction of the federal policy, which has lifted the barriers, with the state policies, with the local implementation, and with the capacity of educators to do all of this, where the rubber hits the road with students, with these kids that will lead to transformed learner experiences and outcomes. So this federal law alone represents a tremendous opportunity, but it will only become a reality if all of these other factors come into play. And that is where you come in, because as states and districts think through how they will implement this law, the state plans are going to be enormously important in how uh, the new accountability and assessment plans are, are designed, um, in, in how the accountability and assessment systems are designed, um, and how states are choosing to use those Title IV funds, for example, to build educator capacity. So it's going to be really important for, for folks like you who are, are on the front lines innovating in K-12 education to weigh in and let your local and state policymakers know this is what's possible and this is how our state plan can support this. And uh, we hear I Nicole and I know Lillian at Knowledge Works and, and her her colleagues will be following this and letting you know in the coming months how you can weigh in. But uh, this this is a, a really important opportunity, but it will only shift away from the status quo if we, we take that opportunity. Um, just really quickly are some issues, some ideas to think about, for states to think about as they are aligning with this new law, um, building competency-based systems to ensure mastery, redesigning assessments around student-centered learning, rethinking accountability, not just for static data points, but for continuous improvement, creating innovation zones and pilots to clear the path for schools and districts to implement personalized competency-based learning, and making sure as, as these innovations flourish that we are evaluating and providing transparency to ensure quality. Creating course access programs to ensure that every student, regardless of where they live, has equitable access to the courses and learning opportunities they need to be college and career ready. Modernizing educator and leadership development in licensure and ensuring that there's fair and adequate funding for these new learning models. And then finally, it's what I like to refer to as learning infrastructure, which are the tools that, that help this whole personalized learning thing work. Um, it's is the development and use of OER, open educational resources, robust technology and broadband 
infrastructure and ensuring that as we have these more data-rich environments that that data is being protected. So with that, I'm going to pass this on to Susan Patrick to make some final, um, final thoughts and to wrap up the webinar. And we thank you all for joining us. Today. Great. Now I'm going to do a quick wrap up and encourage uh, anyone that has questions to be typing your questions in the chat room. Um, when you really think about where we are, it's 2016. With the passage of this new federal law, we have an absolutely historic opportunity to transform K through 12 education. This opportunity has huge potential. And right now, I'm looking across the United States, and we have states that are now empowered to redefine what it means for student success. What does a successful graduate look like? What are these high expectations this new bill calls for? Those are going to be set by states in their state plans. The expectations are going to be set with states talking and engaging in conversations with schools, school leaders, educators, communities, parents, students. This is the time in the next 12 to 16 months before this kicks in that these conversations need to be happening. It is time for our country and each of our states to set a new vision, engage our communities. There are elements of educating the whole child. There are incredible opportunities and tremendous flexibility around this new law to think about how we want to ensure each of our students are prepared for success, that they develop the competencies and mastery that they need, that they are given the personalized learning approaches. And I just want to highlight the innovative assessment pilot provision in here to allow some new models, thinking outside the box, and the creativity of this one-size-fits-all assessment model we've been trapped into is so important. What would that look like to truly align new models of transparency, of accountability for each and every student, for all of our students, that was aligned to student-centered learning and true competency-based education so that we can personalize learning for each child's success. And last, the highly qualified teacher provision is gone. That is a huge opportunity for our field. If you've ever complained about teacher preparation, and I know many, many school leaders uh, believe that most of our teacher preparation is grounded in the last, last several decades, if we want true personalized models of building educator capacity, identifying, as Lillian pointed out, those competencies and building out micro-credentials, new licensure methods, that is all allowed under this new law. So the power is back to the states, it's back to communities, it's back to localities, it's back to schools and school leaders. And we must not let this opportunity pass because what happens with this new law will dramatically affect education in this country for decades to come. Whether the pendulum swings back, whether we take this opportunity and do what is right for our students is absolutely crucial and key. So, just the last little framing, when we need help um, talking to our states and our state leaders, think outside the box for accountability. You might think about before No Child Left Behind, there were some really interesting um, things happening in assessments and accountability for performance assessments in New York and Kentucky and several other states. And then because we have such a patchwork across the country because we weren't collecting data on all of our students and our subgroups. No Child Left Behind was a necessary part of the journey to move towards better transparency. 
So if you think about stages of innovation in our accountability systems and assessment, you might think of the first wave, stage one of innovation, was putting a marker on the ground for no child left behind. We're going to ask all states to have standards, and we're going to measure against those standards, and we're going to ask for that to be broken up by subgroup of students. We're going to ask for that to be more transparent. And that was an important stage that the United States needed to go through. Now, if you think about well, what do future models of accountability look like, I typed in a link earlier for a really excellent report that came out of Stanford um, and LPI, and it really is on different pathways for accountability and assessment. So you might think of the stage two, like what's the stage two? And the California core model where you have a group of districts using multiple measures. Um, but what we're really looking for in this new opportunity in the Every Student Succeeds Act in ESSA is for states to develop stage three and stage four innovations and assessments and accountability. So New Hampshire has a model that uses multiple measures and performance assessments. It's focused on the long game for improving education for our students, and it's focused on the long game of supporting educators and building educator capacity, um, which is so um, well outlined in that paper that Knowledge Works and my Nicole put out. This is about the long game of improving our schools and having systems of continuous improvement. And the best developed stable long-term accountability model I've seen is in Alberta, Canada, our neighbors to our north. Heavy model that supports multiple measures, but it is aligned to student-centered learning. It allows and supports personalized learning, and it provides this benchmarking, continuous improvement, and focuses on individual student growth and how to help the system grow, too. And that is what we need to get to. We need to get to alignment of federal policy, of state policy, and of local practitioners doing great work to, to transform our education system and our, offer powerful personalized learning opportunities for all students. So I want to say thank you so much personally to Maria and Lillian um, not just for the incredible job they've done on today's webinar, but for the hours and hours of work that they have spent on Capitol Hill with the White House, with the Department of Ed, doing education for policymakers on what is possible. And I want to thank all of you today for joining us. Um, any questions, feel free to type in. I know this is a, a lot of um, really important, detailed policy information, and we are so pleased um, to be able to work at INACOL and to be able to work with KnowledgeWorks um, with Lillian uh, to help move the field forward. And we are very, very excited about the next 12 to 18 months under the Every Student Succeeds Act. So if we don't have any questions, I'll just pause for one moment. Be happy to um, wrap up, and if you want to reach out to any of us uh, directly and for additional help, um, my email, Susan Patrick, Maria, or Lillian, um, we're all helpful. So there's a question from Sarah. Do states have a timeline for implementing these changes in teacher certification? And I can turn this over to Maria and Lillian. The thing is, Highly qualified teacher provisions are gone now in the federal law. So states don't have a timeline. It's really up to them to take this on. There are a handful of states that are looking at this right now, but there's not like a deadline. Um, Maria, Lillian, you want to weigh in on that? I, I think Susan's answer was, was really that, you know, states could make changes or they could not make changes. They could maintain their status quo if they wished. Um, I think we'll be looking at regulations, um, if any, that the department puts out on Title II, uh, which is, is the, the program that has to do with teacher professional development. Um, 
and, and to see if there's any plans that states will be required to submit. Um, and other than that, I think we'll be looking towards the Higher Education Act reauthorization, perhaps in the next Congress, which could have some bearing on teacher preparation. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll just add to that. Um, we we expect states to submit their plans for Title One and Two, Titles One and Two and Three. There'll be a consolidated application um, in the probably springtime of next year. Um, so by then, we expect states will probably have their vision crafted for how they're going to proceed under ESSA, at least in the short term. Um, so really this next year is the critical time for these conversations. They will have to state in their plan that they have aligned everything to these state certification requirements. Um, and so I suspect that would be the point in time where they would be revisiting them if necessary. So we're at our time right now. There are a couple more questions which we'll stay on and answer them in the chat box, but I wanted to just thank everyone for their time today and participation in this webinar, and um, thanks for spending this time with us. Bye-bye. Hi, Denise. Uh, if you're still on, I'm happy to try to answer your question. I, 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 and don't hold me to this. I'm happy to look into it and get back to you, but um, the, the entire HQT section is, is no more. So my assumption would be that those same requirements are also gone, but I'm happy to look at it and get back to you, or perhaps Susan and Lillian would know the answer to your question. Yeah, it's my understanding that's all gone. Um, it's been a little bit since I read that part of the statute, but um, nothing, I don't remember seeing anything that was new added in dealing with paraprofessionals. So. It's all gone, and it's up to state to decide, you know, what their new bar is going to be. Yeah, and I would just check on that as a state requirement. Ditto. Any other questions while we're staying over a little bit? I see a question from Ruth about highly qualified teacher. If, if that goes into effect immediately, or is it? by 2017, and Bruce, yes, so this act goes into place for the 2017-2018 uh, school year. However, the department's already made some signals on some other matters that they won't be um, really looking too closely at a lot of the re requirements of No Child Left Behind, and I suspect this is something that would fall under that category. but. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that they've issued guidance specifically on that. Yeah, and I'll just add um, the the administration, um, essentially the, the timeline for No Child Left Behind to expire um, is August of this year, giving states essentially a year's transition time, um, and the department has issued guidance to states on the transition specifically, um, but very much echoing what Maria is saying there, you know, we're seeing all sorts of signals that, you know, really states are in the regroup time period now, um, so I wouldn't expect there to be much more focus on the no child left behind requirements. Thanks, everyone, for your time. We'll sign off now. Uh, have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.